Welcome to another episode of Stoke Meter. And uh, it's funny, in this pre-show, we were going, where's my Stoke Meter day? It's way up. I mean, way up there. And we are, our guest today is, is Brad Schmeely. There's all kinds of ways to say it. That's just the way I know how to say it. Uh, Brad is one of the most inspirational individuals that you're ever going to meet. Uh, we met him back in 2009. Uh, at the time, he, he was a, a professional wakeboarder for uh, Ronix Wakeboards, and he still, still the same, Brad, in every, every uh, way that you could imagine. And minus the abs. Yeah, minus the abs. <laughs> <laughs> and just the charisma that you have, Brad, that's one thing that I remember about you um very very well every time we ran into you it was just it wasn't a cocky bravado it was just this really cool you're I, I i think you're a cool dude i got that response back every time and i think everyone that i've ever spoken with uh has that same opinion and you're it, it's very endearing so to be able to catch up uh 12 years later unreal and thank that's you insane to know that it's 12 years uh <laughs> how crazy time flies i mean it's been seven years since my accident i mean yeah that's yeah. that's nuts to think that that uh yeah that life was that long ago that i was living but man good to good to catch up and stoked you we're, were able to uh to link up again after all these years well i appreciate you even accepting this because it was it was such a treat to get that response back and I'll tell you what, 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 so many of the audience members might not know, uh, of course, when we originally started as wakeboarding, it was the wakeboard side, but Brad uh, was, he, you landed, what, what was it uh, that uh, you landed the double, man, I don't even remember what it's called, but it was a double back to blind, I believe. Yeah, double tantrum to blind, yeah. Unreal, unreal, and uh, he he you're still the only person in the world that's ever landed that right uh there's been so there's been two people have done it two myself people. and liam uh peacock have done it over the mega ramp got it but then in that time between me and liam doing it raf did it up a step up at uh the what was it the shred town ranch at their event the okay. jamboree or whatever it was and then behind the boat now you've had harley okay. corey and massey i think maybe wow and steel oh have, have all done double tension on blind steel did it off a double up and the rest straight off the wake so um Unreal. but to be the first was that was cool man like to claim the real that was my my first like true first right uh, in wakeman you know i was one of the first to do a 1080 i was you know may have been the first to do a step up but yeah it was cool to to, to tick off that double t to b oh and and watching it still yet i i still get anxious watching it because it was the the amount of air oh my goodness fantastic and i guess it goes you said again to the audience seven years ago there was an accident and it was attempting this same the same uh, movement and brad i'll let you explain what happened there yeah so the so this is at lake ronix um and i'd become the on-site manager of of the place just through stubbornness and hard work and basically <laughs> not letting anyone else you know work harder than i was prepared to and made sure that the boss saw it and knew about it and he he offered me the uh the position there and so it was really cool to get that mega ramp we had a you know our own mega ramp at lake ronix and i learned the double tantrum over it and then got an invite to rising high in germany which is the only other place in the world with a mega ramp and uh but their their mega ramp their landing was slightly mellower like it's slightly longer mellower so when you get to the water it wasn't such a an abrupt kind of change from the the down slope of the ramp right um 
and a very similar setup in terms of like the run-in pool was similar size to what we had at Lake Ronex and um but they had it set up so you could hit it both ways uh heel side or toe side and i you know i'd done it when i got there and we're doing the training i did a bunch of double tantrums and and even did a double toe side back roll over the uh the mega ramp and then yeah brent and Priestley and parks were both there and they just started amping me up they're like <laughs> double tantrum blind you got this man like they're just like pumping me up for it so i started trying it and within i think it was about my fourth or fifth try i landed it and um it was incredible it was one of those moments like i had you know my idol parks was like there filming and cheering and um it was you know and, and uh, amongst all my peers and everyone there just it was such a cool moment and i knew i was going to win trick of the year with it like it was just ticking all of these goals that i'd had throughout my whole career right um and so we get back to lake ronex afterwards and we've been filming for the movie prime with sean kilgus right. and um we've been filming you know all season and this was it came down to our last day of filming and he had already captured me doing the double tantrum but we wanted to get the double tantrum to blind at lake ronex because it was a lake ronex section right. uh for the movie so we couldn't use the footage from Germany and um, down to the last day. And I just, I felt the pressure. I put the pressure on myself to do it. I was like, well, everyone knows I can do this trick now. It would be a, a let down not to have it as the final banger at the end of the section. Yeah. And uh, I just kind of pushed myself and um, just backed out at the wrong time. Like I had this bailout point where if I was going for a double, you know, obviously you got to tuck and spin really fast if something felt wrong off the top of the ramp i had until halfway through the first flip to where i could open up slow the flip down and just do a single tantrum and right, right away um but on this particular uh, attempt i cut a little harder i stood up a little taller because i was like okay i need more time in the air but more distance so that i can get over my like solid over my board a bit more and then, um, yeah, when I came off the top of the ramp, I was like, oh, something feels wrong. So I bailed out, you know, I let go of the grab, opened up. And right away, I noticed that I was too far past that point of no return. Oh, man. Um, just had that, oh, fuck, sort of thought. <laughs> yeah. Was, um, I knew it was, it was going to be bad. And everything kind of slowed down in my mind. And so... I, I still had line tension on the handle and I had st still had the rope in my hand. So I tugged on the rope to turn the flip rather than doing one and a half flips. Right. I was coming sort of like around most of the way through the first flip. And by tugging on the rope, I was able to do like a, a backside spin uh -huh. rather than a second flip. So I almost did an indie tantrum to late Olay backside three, like a late whirly bird. Right um but i was 90 degrees short and so i was toes facing down the ramp landed on my board and then tumbled forward and was again had enough time to think but yeah. i was like okay I, i'm not going to go face first into the ramp i want to tuck and roll right and i i tucked my head under but i was just too you know wasn't fast enough at getting my shoulders around and it just uh. yeah slammed my, the top of my shoulders on the ramp and forced my head into my chest and i was out cold and uh yeah thankfully so chad sharp and i like two months before had done a cpr course um together and part of that cpr course was stabilizing a spinal cord injury in water um and the reason for that is because we did the cpr course through the the uh paramedic for the pro tour right so he ran the course obviously around water safety and sure. um so luckily chad was there he and dino raced out to get me um i was unconscious i was face down in the water uh, dino got to me first and flipped me over he thought i was dead um chad got to me with the paddle board and they kind of half pulled me up on the on the paddle board um and i was just yeah wide-eyed blue in the face not breathing not responding um and they were ready to do cpr right then and there um and 
yeah, I don't know what what it was, but something in me must have known that chatter that chowder was about to put his mouth to mine. <laughs> so <laughs> I, w- I woke up on my own and started breathing. So. <laughs> um yeah and obviously from then on it was all pretty hectic you know the first responders got there from the local fire department um chopper came in and and got me by then i was that a neck brace on me a backboard and um yeah uh, i by that point i knew that i'd really screwed up because i in 2007 after winning wake stock in the uk i had a really bad crash trying a air trick or on, oh. on the cable yeah. and got knocked unconscious and i woke up and i wasn't able to move but it only lasted about 30 seconds and then my movement came back so i imagine i must have like in the whiplash must have jarred that p- part of my spinal cord but right. not actually fully damaged it but then this time you know when i woke up and i couldn't move i was like okay you've been here before just relax it'll come back and then after you know 10 minutes 15 20 minutes like nothing so that was when it started to really sink in that i'd really screwed up and um yeah was flown off to the uh to the icu and Uh, rest is history yeah yeah and and just interesting i i I always say first of all i didn't i didn't realize the first time around that i mean four to five attempts just on the first, you know, when you're trying to get it on film is, you know, you always just have it in your mind, like you just send it and then you stick it and you right away. So, I mean, I, that's something I never knew, but I also didn't realize that you were completely out. So yeah. after you got, after you took the hit, it was, I don't know how long it would, would have taken for them to get to you, but it must, for them, it was probably an eternity. Yeah. And then to flip you over and see that you were just completely unconscious had it been just terrifying for them too. Totally. I mean, I'd, I'd imagine it would have been 30 seconds to a minute for them to get to me. Um, they were pretty quick. Like there was no calling out, Hey, you're right. Like they knew I was not okay. Like they yeah. heard the thud, they, they saw it all. So they were quick to get to me, but yeah, it was, um, it was kind of scary. Cause my, my board was actually my, uh toes were facing up so my body was facing upward but my right arm was across my body and so it had twisted my upper body so it was enough that my face was down in the water and um interestingly enough i've found out that you know when you're face down in the water unconscious your body knows not to try to breathe because of this mammalian dive response so if your face is in the water it knows not to breathe so um obviously that that's interesting and cool to find out that that the body does that and that actually ties into some of the stuff i'm doing now with like breath hold training and and pushing myself and that that side of things which is something new that i've found and and kind of gotten into right and then you know again i don't ever want to get too personal what have you but it, you went from able and then when you when you, when you were all settled and you realized that that it was a quadriplegic situation. Um, yeah. w- the range of motions had to be, I can't even fathom. I can't even fathom. And, you know, just yeah. what, what were what were some of the, the thoughts? Because I look at where, where you are now and just that process of change and then the realization and in, into what you're doing now. I just wonder if you wouldn't mind taking us through uh, that, that range of motion. Yeah, well, it was obviously it hit me pretty hard at the beginning. uh, You know, it was also fresh and new. It wasn't like I was picturing Christopher Reeve, Superman, and going, that's who I'm going to be for the rest of my life. Like that, that position, I just was like, fuck, this is gnarly. What have I done? Yeah. You know, kind of beating myself up for backing out on that trick. I remember when I was in the the hospital waiting for surgery, uh, Brenton and Chris were with me. And I just, I just kept repeating. I was like, I was like, why the hell did I back out? Like, you know, I just kept beating myself up for doing that. And then, you know, obviously the guilt kicks in. I knew that my mom, my dad, my family, like they were going to have to fly over, you know, God knows what sort of costs, medical costs. I didn't have insurance. There's all of these thoughts going through my head. Like, 
how am I going to, how are we going to do this? Like, and then after my surgery, I actually don't remember anything for about a week, uh, maybe five days to a week. And um, by that point, my parents had got, you know, my mum had flown in uh, with her partner and a few of my friends had flown in. And I was awake and alert during that time but i wasn't i don't remember it um so i was conscious but when i start when i'm my memories started again and when i can actually remember from that was when it really really hit me because you know i um i saw you know that my my parents had flown over there's all this fuss going on people are organizing fundraisers and and it really started to sink in and actually the morning the first morning i remember i didn't even know that i was paralyzed i thought i was hung over at a <laughs> chick's place that i met downtown you know all i saw was like through the the window at the end of the bedroom was a couple of girls and scrubs getting ready for their day at work to go you know yeah, as nurses and i um so in my mind, I'd actually had a really crazy hallucination the night before that I'd been kidnapped. Oh wow! Um, and so that that the, the hallucination is the first thing I remember. Then this morning waking up, I thought, yeah, I was in this chick's bedroom. I thought she was just getting ready for work and and making herself a coffee or whatever. And she came into the room, and I went to sit up and say good morning. Couldn't move. Couldn't speak that's when it all kind of crashed down. Um, uh, Cause it must've only been a minute that I was there in this weird days thinking I was in some chick's room, like couldn't remember because I got so wasted the night before or something like, it's just what my mind kind of pieced together. Um, and at that point, and probably for the next few weeks, yeah. if there was a button I could have pushed it in my life, I would have done it. Uh -huh. Or I, maybe i i might have done it i, don't, I can't say 100 percent that i would have because there's i've i'd like to believe there was or there's always that fighter in me that you know like no yeah. matter how bad things got there's always that percentage of of me that's that's gonna fight um but yeah the ironic thing is if there was a button i could push to in my life um and if i was able to push it I wouldn't have needed to push it yeah. you know if i had arm movement you know even if i was going to spend the, my, the rest of my life in a wheelchair if i had arm movement it would be okay because i can still be independent you know that was what was going through my mind i even had dreams of being out at lake ronix at the chin-up bar that i've set up like a month beforehand doing chin-ups with a you know sitting in a wheelchair pulling the wheelchair up with me like <laughs> yeah. i had these vis these visions i was like that's how it's going to be and um yeah it was it was a it was a few weeks in when you know a lot of the fundraisers were happening and i really started getting you know the messages of support and visitors and you know family being there and stuff like that's kind of when i decided like okay i'm gonna you know i'm gonna fight this thing and yeah um because there were a few sketchy moments where i almost died you know I was trying to wean off the ventilator and the second day doing it, I pushed it too far and my heart stopped oh. and they had to like resuscitate me in front of my mom. Like oh. it's some gnarly shit to go through. And, and, and I just, I think that was the biggest thing that affected me was guilt. You know, I would look in my mom's eyes and see the pain she was going through. And that was my fault. Yeah. You know? And well, that's how I saw it anyway. And, so um yeah it was crazy range of emotions um i mean you you guys would be able to get the full immersive like uh understanding of the, what i went through uh when my book comes out next year um yeah. but yeah it was it was pretty full on and not something i would wish upon anyone you know it's interesting i'm sorry gary but but in very but knowing some of your friends uh I, unbelievable support i mean i i'm thinking like jeff weatherall and dean smith and uh, and uh parks bonifay all those folks like that and yeah just wondering what 
when when you're in that circumstance and you knew their support what what was it that those support systems from your family i know your brother is there with you as well um yeah. at what point did you did you just grasp it and make that decision because one thing that you saw i saw something that you posted that you you have that ability to make a choice and at, at what point did you make that choice and at what point did you start taking actions upon the, the, those choices um I mean, the actions on those choices was as soon as I was able to start like doing any sort of recovery, any sort of rehab. And for, at the beginning, all that was, was some physios coming in, <clears throat> they put, um, you know, uh, compression stockings on my feet, they put this abdominal binder on me so that when I sit up, I don't pass out with my blood pressure dropping because that, that's just part of it. You know, even to this day, I wear an abdominal binder to kind of stop fluid from pulling in my abdomen and stop me from passing out. Um, but yeah, that was the first thing. They just set me up on the side of the bed and they put a table there, put my arms up on it and like trying to see if I can pull my arm back with my shoulder. And I mean, I had very, very little shoulder movement back then, you know, whereas now I've got good <laughs> shrug. I mean, you know, some of the videos just, that I've been putting up recently, I've got really good upper body um, strength, which is yes. lower than the level of my injury, like lower than it should be, um, or more than it should be, sorry. Um, but yeah, I think like back to the question, obviously having, you know, the likes of Parks and Chad and Ruck and Danny and, you know, I'd, I'd already had my moment of like that surreal moment um, when I became the manager at Lake Ronix and, you know, I was already friends with all of these guys, right. but then all of a sudden I'm in a position where they're coming to me going, Hey, I've got this idea for a rail. How do you think we should do it? Or, Hey, I want to build this. What do you think? You know, they're coming to me for, for my opinion on it and, and, and my help. And all of a sudden I've been put into this, you know, position where, it was just such a cool dynamic with those guys. Like we just became so tight, especially me, Chad and Ruck. Yeah. Um, Cause they were Chad and Ruck were the guys that were coming out every single day to the yeah. lake. Like, um, so we spent every day together, obviously parks and stuff, you know, those guys, we became really close. So I had that kind of moment of realizations, you know, when your, your idols become your friends and that sort of thing. Um, but then obviously like yeah having those guys like weatherall was the guy who stepped up the most you know he, he took charge and was like okay what do we need to do who do we need to speak to like you know he'd speak to other people who'd been through this sort of thing and they were like all right you need to fundraise so then he'd get on that you know hustle people to to start fundraising and so that was really cool um there was actually this weird moment with, I mean, it was, it was a couple of weeks where I actually wasn't allowed to speak to Danny, Chad Parks or Paul O'Brien huh? because I, so I didn't know much of what was going on. I left a lot of it in my mom's hands um, because I didn't have insurance or anything. She was looking into, okay, does Lake Ronix have insurance? You know, does, BFY Productions have insurance does you know this or that and so um we she spoke to a lawyer and I you know the lawyer came in and saw me and I nodded my head to say yep I give you permission to look into this and figure out what we can do and then next thing so the whole time I'm told yep it's insurance it's an insurance claim this and that and then I find out that that's you know you that could be translated to me suing Ronix BFI productions, oh, yeah. all these, other, you know, which is basically what we would be doing. Right. Um, and so legally they, as owners of Ronix, they weren't allowed to speak to me. Uh, um, yeah. And as soon as I found that out and, and that, that I found out that that's kind of how this was actually was, was that I was about to sue these, these companies that I was really close with. Um, I just said, cease and desist. I'm done. No. Nah. I don't care how much money I get out of this. It's yeah. not worth it for me. Um, and so that was, it, it was weird because 
I didn't realize that they were told they weren't allowed to speak to me, but then all of a sudden there was this couple of weeks of silence and then I found out. And so, um, so that was kind of weird, but, uh, I think just in general, the support that was there, uh, there was a really cool moment, which was also pretty frustrating. Um, when I was leaving the ICU to go up to Shepherd Center in Atlanta, um, and it was that morning, they got me set up, ready to leave. And we're waiting, 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 like in my room. And I'd been told there are a few people kind of gathering outside the, the, in the foyer to kind of um, see me off. And, but next thing, you know, the, the life flight guys are like, oh yeah, just hold fire, hold fire, we're not ready yet. And then all of a sudden, okay, yeah, we're ready. And we go out and we go out through the doors and there's like, 40 or 50 people there everyone all my friends all the wakewood crew and it was amazing and i was like awesome and then they just kept rolling straight into the elevator and gone i was oh. like whoa wait what like all these people came to see me and they got 10 seconds that was all all it was and that's all i got to see these people and i'm like why did we wait for half an hour in my room right when i could have come out and hung out with my friends for half an hour like but but just to have them all there and to see them all there and have that support, you know, the, those sorts of moments were the ones that really drove me to, um, to start working hard. And it was so, so hard too, because, you know, I was so used to working hard. I knew what that felt like, but yeah. now I couldn't work hard. Like I had no physical, anything to start with sure. to, to work off. You know, I felt like, all I needed was that 1% of something to start moving and I could get that ball rolling, but it, it just felt like it wasn't happening. Um, and so it was a really frustrating time. Um, I had to learn to be very patient with the, the process, with the journey, uh, with the people around me that are all of a sudden doing all these things for me that I need them to do. Yeah. Um, so it was a huge, huge growing and learning experience like that lasted years and is still going you know and i think that's just life in general right it's yeah. if you're not learning then you know or if you're the smartest guy in the room then you're in the wrong room you need to be somewhere where you can learn that's a great um, saying man I've i got that from uh uh was it jerry lopez um jerry lopez the big wave surfer oh okay yeah okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I was chatting with him at Surf Expo a couple of years ago, and that was one thing he told me, which was quite cool. So we're doing a lot of lot of kind of looking back, and man, I just had a flashback when you were talking about your cease and desist and what you were willing to do, literally the price that you were willing to pay to say no more of this. It, it threw it threw me back to the early Stoke Meter days. We were in a unique position back then because we were we were doing live interviews. You remember back then where we'd get you guys. We were basically doing Facebook oh, Live before Facebook Live even existed. I watched my one recently. Uh, I, <laughs> it was awesome. You yeah. have to cringe, like a, you know, <laughs> if you're looking back on old interviews and stuff of yourself. Like I just laugh. I just <laughs> had to laugh. I'm like, what am I wearing? Like some sort of like. <laughs> sports coat jacket thing and a and a bandana and a cool necklace yeah oh, I was pretty, but, but, pretty the, gangster. but the thing that i look at though is is so i've been following you know i followed your whole journey you know through the years you've kind of gone through all this stuff but you're this you're, you were such an impressive kid how old were you in like oh nine oh nine i must have been 22 22 wow. so you were you're a pretty young kid and uh you were you were killing it you were doing well even back then but i even as much as it may make you cringe i'm gonna have people go watch that stoke meter interview with brad schmele it is it just shows who you are even at that kind of immature top of your game elite athlete and that's one mm -hmm. thing i don't know if some of our listeners realize is what it takes to be a professional wakeboarder mm -hmm. just the uh it, it, you you you're an elite athlete and I think there's a, you know, thinking of, as you went through that, that injury, your whole life was built around 
your physical aspect. You know, I know you did modeling back in the day to kind of pay the bills. You were an elite athlete. Um, did that make it, was that an extra challenge? Because I feel at some point, you not only lost your ability to move, you lost your complete self-identity. Was that? hundred percent. Yeah, that was something there's even um, in my public speaking. And then, you know, there was this moment you know, where I, where I reference that I kind of stopped for a second and it was once I'd left the whole spinal unit, like hospital system, I was back in the community, like moved into this house that I'm in now and everything was the same except me. And then, and all of a sudden, yeah, as you say, like I'd lost the self identity that I would had. And um, all of a sudden I was like, who am I mm -hmm. yeah and uh, and that, that really um that hit me really hard I was like this is weird like I don't you know I feel like I should be doing something but I can't do anything um there's this whole process of grief and I felt like I was grieving the loss of myself um and that was really crazy because I you know I, I looked into was it the some say it's five some say it's seven stages of grief um and i think like i mean around that time i was very lucky i had this woman named susie who's a kinesiologist she helped me out with all of these kind of mental battles one of the first ones was that when i spoke about earlier around guilt around my mom you know i looked at her and i you know maybe she had like some new gray hairs coming through and i was like oh that's because of me or, you know, like anything, um, I felt so guilty because of it. And Susie explained to me and uh, helped me realize that, A, I have no control over what other people do or feel or say or act or anything like that. I have no control of that. That's all on them. Yeah. And as a mother, that's what a mother is supposed to do is to worry about their child, you know, and especially in a situation where, she's not able to to really help um solve the problem right uh i can you know it, it allowed me to see things from her perspective um but then also allowed me to kind of let go of that uh guilt and responsibility around how she felt because that's not yeah that's not up to me um so yeah and uh, so i was very lucky to have susie helping me through all all of this stuff and um, that question of who am I caused us to start looking into belief systems. Yeah. Um, you know, firstly, the belief that my physical ability is what made me attractive to women, is what made me me, is what made people want to be friends with me, like this belief that can be broken down. Um, and, and it, I mean, there's a whole whole journey going into the belief system side of things and, and learning basically how we're wired from day one when we're born. You know, there's the genetic coding DNA stuff from, you know, that we're born with, but everything else from then on is coded in. It's programmed. It's, it's what we're surrounded by. It's, you know, what our parents uh beliefs are it's yeah. could be cultural could be religious could be societal beliefs you know body image stuff especially around women at the moment or you know even with men it's like all of the stuff is you know once you look into it and you understand what it really is where it comes from what causes it who's driving it um that's when you start to be able to break those beliefs down and, and then start to kind of rebuild, I guess, that, that programming to work with, you know, I guess the body and the, the life that I have now. Yes. Um, Cause it, you know, the way that she put it, it was like, I'm, I'm running the same software on a different <laughs> yeah. computer, yeah. you know, and the, the software is not compatible at all. So it needs to be reprogrammed. And that's what I had to do. But most people never have to make that reboot, so to speak. 
Yeah, well, like, it's more of a, it's more of like your, you know, on your computer, you get the every couple of days, oh, a new update available, new update available. <laughs> you know, that's that's quick and painless. That's nothing. Yep, we, you know, the computer learns and updates as you go, which is what most people do. And it was funny over the, let's say, five years of, after my accident, I ended up chatting with a few guys who had, you know, some pro wakeboarders, like Sir Jimmy Lurich and. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a few of the, you know, the guys on my team and, and they were going through a lot of the same changes as what I was, but mine were instant and theirs were over a span of, uh, years, you know, going from being a pro wakeboarder to then, oh crap, what am I going to do with my life now? Yes. I can't be a pro wakeboarder anymore. That's interesting. I never really thought about that before. Yeah. So as a, basically any sport, any, anybody that's an elite, whatever, you know, just the natural aging process alone, they kind of have to go through that, but you just got the accelerated version. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. some. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I did find the quote that I saw from you and it goes, my newfound superpower is the power of choice. And that, that really hit me. I, I couldn't remember where I'd seen it, but I wrote it down and when I look at the choices you've made to impact people, um, I, again, I'm inspired, uh, I'm, I'm touched. And I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind going over some of the things that you've done, because there's, <laughs> there's some pretty cool things that you, you've had in the mix. One is the, the team B-Rad or Brad with a hyphen, right? B-Rad. But the other thing too is the wings for life. I wondered if you could go in a little bit about that because when I saw that website, um, it was actually a Red Bull website that was that was pulling that in. Yeah. Couldn't help but smile, right? Yeah, well, it's, so Wings for Life. Um, it's been funny, like I, you know, I'm, you know me. I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I'll be straight <laughs> up and you know uh, transparent about everything. Um, when the injury happened, Wings for Life rushed in or Red Bull because they're tied in together. Right. Oh, what can we do to help? What can we do to help? And then they found out that I wasn't a Red Bull athlete and boom, radio silence. Oh. So I was, I had this real negative thing toward them at the beginning. Like I was <laughs> like, ah, oh. well, especially because my whole career, I wanted to be sponsored by Red Bull. Right. And I felt like I'd been screwed over with, you know, w- Red Bull New Zealand because Wakeboard New Zealand had screwed up some relationship with them. And, right. and that impacted my, you know, possibility of getting on board with him and so there was this there was this little bit of like animosity i guess um around that but uh, you know i let that go pretty quickly you know i was looking into the the wings for life stuff what they do um it is an amazing um charity or foundation and it's really cool that that red bull of you know they use their resources to to drive that thing um and when you get the wings for life world runs that again was another one that just, you know, to have all the, all the wakeboard crew, you know, form a team and, you know, running for me, running for Ben LeClaire. Um, and, you know, again, it was just such an amazing support uh, or show of support to get. And, um, and yeah, I'd been in contact with, with Wings for Life a little bit, just kind of finding out where their research is at and, um, you know, it's awesome to know that every single dollar raised through the wings for life world run goes to the funding so it's actually red bull pay to host those events so none of that none of the operating costs are coming out of what's raised um so i think that's really really cool and uh and then yeah this year well last year actually some friends and i got out and and it was the first time i took part and it was pouring rain 11 (laughs) o'clock on a sunday night because we all run at the same t- same moment. So in New Zealand, it happens to be Sunday night, 11 o'clock. Um, and we were just getting drenched, but it was so much fun. And then this year we did it again, had a really cool crew of about 120 people all running in Auckland and then just people all around the world um, running and being uh, just all running for the, for the, the cause to try to, you know, see if they can come up with a cure. And 
I'll be honest, I'd lost a little bit of motivation around that. Like obviously early on, I was like, okay, when's the cure coming? When's the cure coming? What's going on? Like real right. and, yeah, eager. Um, and I remember around the time of the accident, there was, you know, the word I got was, oh yeah, the cure's five years away. But then next thing I'm chatting with a dude who's been in a wheelchair for 20 years. And yeah. that was what he was told when he had his accident. Oh, it's five years away. Right. It's five years away. It's been seven years now. They'll probably say it's another five years away. Right. So that was pretty frustrating to, for me. And, and that kind of led to me not so much giving up on that, but switching my focus more to rather than like, you know, when's this cure, cure coming to, to fix me so that I can be okay with myself? It's yeah. okay. How can I be okay with myself and love who I am now? um regardless of if a cure comes and if i get movement back or not you know because at the end of the day like who knows i i spoke with a spinal cord injury doctor and he said that in his eyes a cure means 30 percent recovery mm -hmm. you know like that's whereas most people think cure okay you're up out of a wheelchair and running around again yeah. it's just not the reality um so yeah, it's, it's been interesting. I still keep an eye on the research and where it's at. There is some exciting stuff happening, but I've sort of taken my investment, personal investment out of it. Uh, and I'll just, you know, figure if it, if it happens, it happens, but I'm going to do what I can now to, um, to still, you know, live the best life I can. And cause at the end of the day, I mean, as I said, seven years have just flown by. Yes. You know, another seven years, that's longer than I was wakeboarding. Yeah. Like yeah. it's, and it's what you scary just, when you start thinking of it like that. It is. And what you just said was very profound is that we're always hoping for something better without accepting who we are right now and, and making those choices right now. That's my goodness. That, we, we interviewed someone that was into uh, not psychology, but basically helping human performance. And that was one of the first things that they said mm -hmm is that ability to accept who you are right now. And that's how you become better. That's yeah. That, acceptance that, that, is yeah. massive. Acceptance mm -hmm. is one of the biggest things that I had to take on. I hated the word acceptance. I was like, nah, I'm not accepting this. <laughs> but then I learned that acceptance isn't accepting all of the beliefs that I have that come along with quadriplegia. Yes. You know, it's, it's accepting that this is where I am now. And that I can't go back and I can't, you know, I can't change things yes. in the future now. Um, but yeah, as, as I was saying before, and as you mentioned that, that kind of um, idea of, you know, everyone's got this idea of, oh, if I get this, then I'll be happy. Yes. If I can get this much money, then I'll be happy. If I can get this partner, then I'll be happy. What about now? What about just learning to be happy with what you've got and not, not putting this kind of built up meaning on something happening in the future and assuming that we're all of a sudden going to be happy because of it. Cause it's, it's not the case. I mean, sure money, you know, the whole thing, you know, money doesn't buy happiness, but it can buy a boat and a boat makes you happy. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Like, sure. It, there is an element of like amount of pleasure and joy that can come from, you know, having money and resources and stuff but there's a an amazing quote now i don't know the 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 full quote um properly but it's out of a book called the way of the peaceful warrior mm -hmm. and the main quote that i use from that which ties in with what i'm about to talk about is uh, the secret to happiness you see is not found in seeking more but in developing the capacity to enjoy less um and i had to kind of like go over that a few times to really let it sink in that you know at first i was like what how does having less make you happier but it's not about having less it's about the capacity that we have um and a part of that chapter as well in that book that he talks about you know there are two ways to become rich one is to get enough money to you know to do all the things that you want to do and have all the things that you want to have or it's about 
adjusting our um, beliefs around you know what we want and what we think is going to bring us happiness and you know that capacity to enjoy less so like you know someone who lives off the land and and lives out in the wilderness and you know they don't need much to be happy like sure they could have everything in the world um and that may you know that they, they may be happy with that but they could have nothing and they'd be happy as well so it's not necessarily about well it's either about what you know how much money you have right. to be able to buy the things you want or it's about adjusting what you want and what fuels your happiness and what drives you to then understand that i don't need all that money to be happy because i have everything i need um mm -hmm. But I mean, I've kind of butchered the way that he he quoted it, but uh, it's a really cool book. Probably my fav favorite book I've read is Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Right. Um, but yeah, there's just, it's this illusion that people buy into that, oh, if I have this, I'll be happy. <laughs> it's like, no, we got to, happiness comes from within. Like we got to drive that from within ourselves, not yeah. from exterior things. That's it's funny. Well, let's say I was having a discussion with my wife literally yesterday. <laughs> and I was just thinking, you know, just about some of the other interviews we've had where it's interesting. There's kind of like these weird kind of interconnected themes. And what you're talking about is really what I've been thinking a lot about lately. And I turned to my wife and I said, name the top two things that that you have bought in your life that make you happy. And she literally sat there for about a minute and a half. And the only thing she could really come up with is like, oh, I, I love our house that we have to live in. But she was, but she kept going back to family and, you know, friends. I was like, no, 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 no. I'm saying, what is it that you've bought? Yeah. You know, I had to keep corralling her back in, you know. And uh, I, you, you really made a big impact on me when you said, you know, you had to stop looking for not looking, but you had to quit focusing on the cure so much and then reel back and say, let's work on, on me. You know what I mean? Like change, like you said, change your programming, change your focus. And I, I've seen as I followed your story as well, you've even taken it to another level is you're also trying to help other people as well. You're doing, can you tell us a little bit about like, you mean doing motivational speaking and that type of stuff? Yeah. What else do you do? Um, I just had something pop on, up into my head just then. Um, uh, and it's gone. Um, <laughs> it'll, it'll have to come back to me or it won't. Dude, that's um, my move, man. Oh, no, so, sorry. So what, so what we were saying before, and it goes back to, um, you know, what, what we're talking about with choice, you know, the, the superpower of having choice. Yes. And so what I was kind of going through over the years was constantly focusing on all the things that I couldn't do anymore, because that was the most prevalent thing, the biggest change, everything around me, there's everything, there's like all of these things I couldn't do anymore. And it was so hard not to focus on that. So hard not to look at my buddies out there enjoying them, themselves wakeboarding and and stuff and for me to be okay with watching that without feeling like I was missing out and what fixed that for me or what really allowed me to to be happy again was not focusing on what I don't have but focusing on what I do have which yeah. for everyone is you know is such a powerful thing to do and um and for me to be able to choose okay you know, maybe not focus on the cure so much anymore, but focus on, okay, what can I do? Part of that was helping people, you know, and, and that was just through um, that guy that I told you about who had been in the chair for 20 years or had his injury 20 years ago and, you yeah. know, cure is going to be in five years. So he's out of his wheelchair. He wow. was very lucky with his injury um, that he was able to, to get on his feet again. He's not, you know, back to normal, but he's, you know, able to walk and stuff. And um, he invited me, so he's a, an Australian guy, but he came over to New Zealand for a, a public speaking engagement that he'd been hired for. And he invited me to come along to it. It was at some chiropractic convention thing. And so I went along and that listening to him speak was what 
inspired me to to start doing public speaking and i i started small with like the company that imports these wheelchairs into new zealand who i've got a good relationship with and mm -hmm. there were like 20 of them in the room and then over the, over the last few years i built up my biggest one was to 1800 people oh, nice. um, in a huge theater um at an event called semi-permanent which is quite a big global event um and you know i've speak at all all ranges of things from schools to corporate events to you know charity events and, and all sorts of things and it really just it's amazing to be able to you know just through sharing my story just through literally doing what i'm doing now just talking about my experiences yeah i'm able to have an impact on other people's lives especially when i'm speaking at schools you know and and one thing that obviously is uh pretty shitty is in new zealand we've got a really high youth suicide rate um and so that's something that i'm like look if i can have an effect on just one person yeah it's worth it you know it's and i've had messages from you know there's a guy who messaged me saying hey look if i hadn't stumbled across your page i was you know i was considering ending my life and i you've you've helped me to keep going and i was like whoa man like that is that's amazing that alone is yeah. just makes it all worth it um yeah. wow. and you know i don't like to look at it as oh, i saved this guy's life but it's just it's something that you know for me to be able to pass this knowledge on um and that's why i really was passionate about writing my own book because i want others who go through this injury to be able to read something from start to finish and really absorb um, certain things. And, and it depends on what part of the process they're in. They may absorb some things better than others. They may not be ready for certain things at the end, but it's not just for people in that situation. It's for anyone. Everyone goes through something. So if we can learn the tools to, to be able to get through our hardest times like that's what i've kind of tried to weave through the the story in my books for people to be able to leave with these tools to to use themselves and um and so yeah it's cool and then there's also some one-on-one -on -one stuff i've done like if there's people who are you know going through a new injury and they want to meet someone who's gone through it and um i'm a, i'm very like respectful in that in those moments because i know that in my first year after the accident i didn't want to see anyone yeah i didn't want someone in a wheelchair coming in and telling me how my life was going to be yeah and how it's all going to be okay and so i make sure i approach it uh from an angle of hey this is what's worked for me um and you know you when i'm going to when i'm speaking to those sorts of people that, that it's obviously very early on so I'm never going to say, hey, life's great. Living, you know, life can still be okay living in a wheelchair because I don't want them to think that that recovery is not an option because for the first few years, that should be all they're focusing on is physical rehab recovery because there is a chance. Yeah. Um, I just got to the point after three years of full-time, like full-time rehab that I just didn't see the results and uh, I felt like I was getting depressed because of it. And um, that actually led to a really big turning point, you know, breakdowns lead to breakthroughs. So I had a pretty big breakdown after that. And then that really turned things around for me. That was kind of the crux of, you know, that, that turning point that kind of uh, turned things back around for me. The new chapter. That, that's, oh, yeah. that's heavy, heavy. It's interesting because I was just thinking about an interview we did a couple months ago with Sean Murray, and he was he was saying something that he was unhappy with wakeboarding because he he got to the point where he felt like he was impressing others as a built-in audience uh, in the back of the boat, and it wasn't until that he realized that I have to do it for myself, so yeah. that that I could feel better. But then through that the process of inspiring others and to see this cycle uh that that you have went through 
and then to have watched some of the a lot of your videos actually i saw one where you're doing the rocky thing <laughs> right you're getting you're getting the calorie you're talking to the camera and and, and moving your arms and saying that it's not, that's how you're getting your calories I, I literally about fell over when i saw the movement i was absolutely blown away and you're well, like, the, yo go ahead go ahead uh with the the one when i'm on the arm cycle is that it that yes so yeah that, that thing a lot of the time i have to like pretty much every time i post that a video like that i have to put a disclaimer with it uh -huh. and the disclaimer is that there is a motor inside the, <laughs> the arm thing that actually moves my arms for me um and then it's so so how that thing works is it's got uh electrical stimulation pads that stick to my arms gotcha. uh, or they they stick to all the all the muscle groups around shoulders arms and everything so there's 24 different electrodes that stick to my body wow. um and so they they trigger the muscle at the right time of the movement to contribute to the movement wow. um the obviously the motor inside is making the movement happen but then it's about my own intention and yes. my you know the the effort that i put in that makes the difference and you can see the difference if i'm doing sitting there doing nothing the arms are moving yep. but if i'm putting the effort in, my shoulders are going my head's going exactly. i'm like you know really really driving it um but it's funny you know, i get people all the time oh my god you can move your arms i'm like oh. <laughs> well but the, but the but the other part though you sat up for 10 minutes i saw yeah. that one that was legit oh hey, hey wait wait i got a new one coming in the next few weeks which will which will hopefully blow some minds it'll probably have the same effect so you've seen the exoskeleton stuff i do where i'm walking in those robotic legs i have seen yes 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 yeah so that's something i've been working on and and when we started on that like we had always had one person with their hands on my shoulders we had like uh, upper body harness with like bungees going forward and back to kind of keep me balanced in the middle right and every time the 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 legs you know the exoskeleton moves it's quite a abrupt robotic movement so I've, I've got to like adjust my body to go with it to balance and over the last few years of doing that i'm at the point now which this video i want to film is um st from start to finish from me sitting down on the edge of the the table that they have me on um, to get me into the machine and then they stand stand it up same yeah. as if you're standing up off a chair off a couch you got to rock your upper body forward right. get your weight forward and then stand up so i have to do the same thing and i have to lean further forward than i can bring myself back from uh, in order to stand this thing up right. and we always have hands on my shoulders at all times right. doing that this video I want to film in the next couple of weeks is from start to finish. Nobody touches me. I, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to stand up completely from, from a sitting position in this exoskeleton without, you know, anyone helping and then go through all of the movements, walking around the gym, sitting back down without anyone uh, touching me. And I did most of it the other day. And even they were able to take my arms off the armrests and have my arms hanging so there's no shoulder pushing down through the armrests anymore to right. balance and i was able to get through all the movements balancing without my arms to support me so yeah wow. it, was, it was pretty cool and i'm hoping in the next few weeks we'll be able to uh get the full stand and everything without any help that's so awesome that, seriously i i I'm, I'm, so I'm, cool. i want to see that I want to see that. Me too, no, man. Me too. <laughs> the thing that hits me across the face when you're talking about everything you did before and everything you did now is that recovery can mean a lot. It can mean a lot of different things. You know what I mean? It's it's not, it's recovery mentally. It's using technology for recovery. It's yeah. mindful. You're just the a prime example of what recovery means, the, you know, so on that one of the things that used to always get to me was people messaging me saying how's progress because i always had to either lie right. to be positive which for so long in those first couple of years like i had this positive out of shell on when i was not positive on the inside like it was so fake 
Yes. Um, but it was my coping mechanism. It was my way to kind of survive, fake it till you make it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and when people would ask me how's progress, I'd either have to give them a, you know, let them down with a, a negative response, or I'd have to, you know, bullshit them. And, and I would do, I would for the, you know, for a while there, I was like, you know, positive, positive, positive. Um, but what I did to make it so that I could give a positive response was I just changed the meaning behind progress. I was like, yeah, progress is amazing mentally, you know, like that's all I'd have to add in, you know, like I, I just completely leave out what they were asking about, which was physically. Yeah. You know? And I just that's ignore that. No, no, it's great mentally, you know, cause that's what, for me, that's, that's what was, uh, had become most important because that physical recovery wasn't happening yeah. that's awesome brad you're an inspiration man i i don't even know how to say it more and as all of these things come about your book and such i'm hoping that we can revisit all of this because you're you're fantastic dude you you are again just as charismatic as when i last was in your presence and it's a whole different ball game, but you've made that ball game yours. And I can't thank you enough for that time. All right. Thanks, Maurice. Yeah, it's uh it's been one hell of a journey, that's for sure. It's uh yeah, it's interesting. And and that's one thing, you know, you get a lot of people will come to me and they're like, Oh, I could never get through what you've got been through in the set. And it's like, well, no, like we we don't know what we're capable of until we get put in that position um and i think we all have a lot more strength within us than we give ourselves credit for um and we also i think something that's really important is to understand that we all struggle and there's this illusion especially with social media that oh everything's okay everything's great look at my photoshopped highlight reel of my life you know and (laughs) <laughs> there's a there's a, a really cool image that um describes it really well where it's got like a mirror and someone's holding an apple in front of the mirror and the apple looks perfect something you'd want to fully bite into but then it shows the back of the apple which is all rotten and got worms <laughs> coming out and everything and it's like it's a it's a really good kind of analogy for social media and this fake positivity and this fake like everything's okay um yeah i just think it's really important for people to check in on each other and and um so i was at a uh, the night before my friend's wedding and I, me and all my buddies were there we'd flown into australia for it and i'd had a really shit week leading up to it i had a bladder infection and all this stuff and obviously i arrived and it was oh hey brad how are you oh yeah not bad oh yeah i'm all right yeah yeah bye bye you know as you do for someone's like hi how are you it just yeah. rolls off the tongue even if you don't care actually how that person is <laughs> right. um and we have gotten into the habit of answering that so just yeah it's all right yeah everything's all right yep all good you know like without going into depth with it and that's fine in your day-to-day just in passing you know you don't want to go in depth with one of your colleagues or something who just asked how you were just because it's polite um but so halfway through the night i'm there and a friend comes up to me he's like hey brad how are you man and i was like yeah I'm, i'm i'm doing all right you know i've been working on this project and i've just been doing this rehab and i've been the doing this and that and started explaining this project i was working on and he's like he cut me off he's like hey man like that's that's cool and everything but i want to know like how are you because what you're going through must be incredibly challenging and then he even like like allowed me to break my barrier down even more by opening up about some of his own struggles and by doing that he and i were able to have this really genuine in-depth conversation um and it's something that we don't do very often you know and and yeah especially amongst guys it's you know we'll just bravado and there's all this like kind of you know we've got to act tough and like everything's all good but everything's not all good especially this day and age man like 
the world's going crazy at the moment. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, and everyone's like, you spend too much time looking into everything going on. You're going to give yourself anxiety. You're going to make yourself depressed. You're going to, you know, like it's, it's important to uh, debrief and to, to kind of offload that stuff every now and again. And um, so I think that's something that's really important for, for people to do. You are the man. Thank, Brad, thank you. For wonderful words of wisdom. Wonderful words of wisdom. My and, pleasure. And of course, Gary's going to ask, we, we can do it again. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I've got so much more I want to ask. I have so much more I want to talk about. So. Yeah, yeah, let's let's uh, let's catch up once the book comes out, and I'm sure, sure that'll just that'll trigger a whole bunch more questions. Oh, let's do it, man! Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, uh, <laughs> Brett, thank you for your time, and again for those wonderful words of wisdom. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me. Thanks, Brad. Yeah.